Holy, holy, holy. This is the language of heaven. Although words can never express the magnitude of how amazing God is, these are still the words that the angels and the elders around the throne have chosen to use. And if they, in the presence of God, will use these words, how much more us, us pardoned, redeemed, loved, ransomed, God's presence is in this place. And I pray that any walls that are standing between us and experiencing him in the way that heaven does, in his completeness, be brought down, be removed, be taken away, and that his presence can fill this place and we can worship as those around the throne. So please stand with us as we sing, Holy, Holy, Holy.
the idea that our God would want to share even the tiniest portion of who he is with us is a revolutionary thought. May we never consider it ordinary. May we never get used to it and may it never be something we just so simply accept, but something we constantly remind ourselves of how amazing it really is. yet. We have a song to teach you if you don't know. It's called Promise of the Ages and it's one of our favorite. We're going to do it again this week so take your time to learn it if possible and um, if you don't know the song that's okay. Read the words, they're amazing and I'm sure you'll catch on.
We are in a journey. Good evening, everyone. Sometimes we are on a, on a journey physically, sometimes spiritually, sometimes alone, sometimes together. We, as a Hungarian Union pastors, we have a wonderful story about a journey together. In 1975, a group of believers started their journey, not with the worldwide church, but separately. In the next few minutes, we would like to share our experiences, how God led us in our way, being again together in this journey. It was a long, long journey. 
is a lot of pain, sorrow, tears in congregations, breaking of relationships and families. But God has worked behind the skins. A lot of prayers went up to him. This is our story. I don't believe in divorce. I don't believe in remarriage if the chosen person is the same person whom you divorced. Can you imagine being remarried after 40 years of divorce with the same person? Getting so many wounds and giving so many wounds, having fears, prejudices. So this was how we started dating each other. Two groups of leaders, those who separated from the church 40 years ago, and uh, we from the union. I was skeptical, and I said, it will never happen. 40 years, it will never happen. But after a while, I realized that God is writing a new history for us. He is writing even a new past. How shall we see our past? And he is also writing a new present and a new future for us. And uh, I felt the assurance that I can be part of this healing process. And this was a spiritual journey, a spiritual experience for me. Uh, it is history as, and we are part of this uh, wonderful history of God's church. Uh, for me, it was a very, very good experience, this joining together when we visited the joining pastors and uh, we, we saw the, the faith, the same faith in their eyes, the same hope, the same enthusiasm for, for mission, for God. And uh, when the opportunities, when the doors of the opportunities come, uh, I was very enthusiastic to, to be part of this uh, healing process. Brothers and sisters, you just heard this summary from the union president and the two conference presidents of a journey that has gone on for 40 years. Multiple attempts have been made. In fact, eight attempts were made, and many others, to reconcile the two communities, a broken family. And uh, in 2012, the process was started again. What you see here before you a united family under God's guidance. But I'm interested in this bike. It looks actually longer than my car back home. <laughs> Seriously. Is that, is that made in Hungary or? Yes. It's homemade, actually. It's homemade. Very impressive. I just wondered, uh, uh, we have a beautiful story behind here, a family united, but come on, a bike on the platform, what does this have to do with it? Uh, this is what we came with, what we traveled with. All the way from Hungary? Yes. How many kilometers? 367. Oh, wow. Did you hear that? 367. Give them a hand. Now, I'm assuming that it takes two people here to make this happen. Now, did you know each other for a long time? Uh, for a few years that we know each other. And how did you, why did you decide to cycle here? And I like that you're wearing your badges. This is very good. Uh, <laughs> but why, why did you decide to cycle to the pastor's meeting? The Mongol Brisil is a colony, and we were able to get to Gabor, and we were able to get to Gabor. 
a másik egység. Actually, it looked like a good adventure and much fun, and we have become anyway good friends with Gábor when he rejoined with the group to, into the church. Wow. <laughs> and I'm anyway going anywhere with the bike, actually, I'm cycling. It's fantastic. I, I want to thank you for joining us here, and let's give them again as a hand, friends. <laughs> And I have a few more questions to our leaders of the union. Tamás, Ernő, Robert, don't go very far. Uh, Geza, where are you? Yes, please join me. Esteban, come forward. And Janos, please come forward. A um, few questions about the whole thing, the way the, your two families got united. And I'm just interested, volunteer, I'll ask Robert first. What do you think that brought these two families together? What happened that is different from the previous processes that happened over the years? I, I, I'm wondering about that. I, I grew up in a broken family, actually. Uh, this was the thing that we never talked about. It was something uh, taboo. And um, I believe that what really brought us together is friendship, spending time together, uh, trying to get to know each other. And I, I believe that was really the, uh, a very important factor for us, uh, why we stick together. Hey, Stefan, you, you were one of the leaders, and uh, I know you're very good in English, you're very fluent. <laughs> so tell us a little bit, from your side, uh, from the Kerak side, what were some of the factors that really built this to come to a beautiful climax of unity? Yeah. For decades, there were, there were prejudices against the official church in the Kerak. And then uh, there was an indication of change when Brother Wilson was elected as a general conference president. Then we have congratulated him, and we have received a response from the general conference secretary. And then something happened, and uh, we met at the first time, you and me, in 2011, as you remember. And Brother Ben Schoen, who was with you at that time, uh, had said after the end of that negotiation, the session, that anyway we should have personal connections with each other to build up something. And I think this is what we have experienced there. And beside this, what is very important, that we have understood on our part, on our behalf in Karak, who were joining the church, how important it is to uh, belong to the Church of God and there are no excuses uh, to be a part of it. Beautiful. Um, Janos, uh, you were the, the leader of Kerak at the time of the whole discussion. And I remember meeting many times and I, uh, we cried together and we prayed together. Sometimes, yeah. Yes, and, uh, and it was wonderful to see that if your heart, if God puts on your mind and heart, if you're in the right place, God can move mountains. And he really moved a mountain, a 40-year mountain, uh, which created difficulties for families, for communities in Hungary. Uh, wh what is your experience? What are your thoughts when, you, when this whole thing was going on? Uh, I would like to say thanks to God and, and some brothers who are sitting here. Um, I grew up in Hungary, and, but my relatives here lives, live here in Serbia. And, uh, and when I was a child and I spent here summers here in, in, in Yugoslavia, they always um, accepted me. They, they calm and, and kind, brotherly love. Uh, may I mention some names? Yeah. Lazic Bato, Miroslav Puic, Sándor Salma, Erdeg Robert and Sándor Bajic Milan. I, I thank God that they were my, my brothers in spirituality and my relatives as well. So it was a very, very big uh, power uh, source for me. Thanks, God. Thank you. Praise God. And I always felt when I met you, both of you that you always wanted to be part of God's family. And, and yes, I think that, that, that was in your heart. Yes, yes. yes. Working together and, and crying and laughing together. So Fantastic. And I saw this over and over again since 2012, how this, the leaders and the pastors started meeting together and sharing together and building that trust, isn't it? That was a fantastic thing, what the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit did. Tamash, uh, 
What are some of the lessons learned out of this experience? Uh, you had to convince your membership, isn't it? You needed to convince your membership just to, uh, to be convinced, everybody. This 40 years separation, how do you build trust as well among the membership? What do you think are some of the lessons learned? It is an ongoing pro process. Uh, the journeys still go on. Um, we haven't finished yet. Um, I grew up in a pastor family. My father was involved very much in this process during these 40, more than 40 years. And I always remember then after a fell down, uh, fell down uh, event, uh, he was very sorry, tears and tears and prayers. But the story was always the following. Both sides, the Kerak and the Union sides, try to seek their own justice, legal justice, who was right in 55, who was wrong in 55, and what's happened from that time, and who did wrong things and who didn't did wrong things. That was the method all the time. And God just changed the generations. And both sides, a new generation grown up. And uh, this generation did, was, wasn't involved at all. I and my fellow officers was, was uh, kids in that time. So we, we were uh, absolutely out of this story. But now, what we, what we experienced, that we started a um, totally different approach. We started to listen to each other. To, we started to understand each other. It was extremely uh, interesting experience that after one year, we started to understand the other's language. The vocabulary changed a lot during these 40 years. So we need to understand each other. We need to build trust uh, among us, leaders first, later among the pastors, and uh, among the members, we organize uh, some kind of common uh, programs uh, helping. Uh, we, we got a lot of help from the division, from the general conference to organize these events. So this was the totally new method. We tried to listen to each other, to understand the others, and that was the result that after 40 years, 750 new members joined to our church congregation. Praise God. Geza, Geza, I'm going to ask you a simple question. What message do you have to our pastors here and the world church about something that we need to avoid? We cannot afford these kind of 40-year separations. It creates a lot of brokenness, and how do we heal? What message do you have for the World Church and our pastors here? Our message is uh, a message of hope. There is always hope, even after 40 years of separation. And uh, we, we couldn't afford us to, to separate. And uh, I see that um, there are some things in the church, many people want to, to go on their ways, and um, May this, uh, this uh, story uh, be a lesson for all of us that we couldn't afford this. That's right. Same question to you, Erno. Can you help me? Uh, I realize that uh, we need to be honest when we try to resolve a conflict. After a while, we, we started to, to talk about our fears, our negative thoughts. And uh, after that, it was much easier uh, and I learned uh, that unity, it's a very expensive gift, and uh, we paid the price. So my message would be uh, keep dialogue, communicate, and pray together if a conflict is in place, and God will do his part, and this is a miracle. Wonderful, wonderful advice. We praise God for this. Um, I would like to commend our leaders and our pastors, all of you here,
because you had to make some difficult decisions. You were under a lot of pressure to make decisions to unite together as a family. We were part of this, we saw this, but God brought this to a beautiful climax. So I praise God for what he has done and the way he has led. Elder Wilson, if I can invite you to join me. Um, there, have been, there have been eight attempts by the division and the general conference to reconcile the two families together. And I believe your father, um, and actually the whole almost GC administration, 10, 10 individuals, your father, the officers of the general conference, they were in Hungary for a period one time of three weeks just reconciling the two parties to bring them together. And uh, after the last GC session, oh, let me see. Yes, the one before. You were approached by members of the CARA group to uh, use your influence to reconcile the two groups together. And you started a process. And you sent uh, your vice president, Ben Sean, uh, Dr. Ben Sean, to, to be part of that process. So any comments from your side? Uh, on, on this wonderful, wonderful miracle of transformation and unity? Well, we just uh, know that our hearts are overflowing with joy and praise to God. Uh, my heart, their hearts, the hearts of the church worldwide, but most of all, heaven is rejoicing. Uh, there were many people involved in this process over many years. I think even beginning with Elder Pearson, Certainly my father had a great burden for this, spent time, uh, Elder Falkenberg, Elder Paulson, and so many others. And as you said, Ben Schoen joined you and things began to come together. But I think the, great, <clears throat> the greatest power <clears throat> that can be seen in what has happened is the power of the Holy Spirit, Amen. touching people's hearts and helping them, as has already been mentioned, uh, to talk to each other and to listen to each other. And I think uh, this bicycle and uh, the riders coming together is just symbolic of what a beautiful spirit there is. And we just praise God for, for what he's doing. In parenthesis, I just have to say, Pastor Tomas, your beard is fantastic. <laughs> He's far more ready for Battle Creek than some of us. But, you know, I think we can learn from the past, from pioneers, <clears throat> and learn from our experience and realize that God has incredible things ahead for us if, as has been indicated, we don't forge our own way, but we stay together by God's grace. Thank you. Um, Pastor Wilson, can you pray for us and pray for this group? And pray for this group here as well, that God will continue to help us stay focused on the purpose why we are here. Thank you. Let's bow our heads. Our Father in heaven, we humbly come before you this evening. We see the incredible power of heaven that has moved on the hearts of those who were with the Karak group and those with the Hungarian Union and how hearts were melted as people listened to heaven and allowed the Holy Spirit to bring about a connection and an understanding to overcome differences, to understand that we are united in our mission to proclaim to the world the three angels' messages and the fourth angel of Revelation 18, of bringing the righteousness of Christ to the forefront and helping people to realize that they can be saved through the grace and the blood of Christ and his work within us. Lord, we ask now that you will bless this united group in the Hungarian Union. Give them unusual heavenly power Give them a double portion of your spirit as they reach out to every corner of the great country of Hungary and touch people's lives with an everlasting message. So, Lord, I place these precious representatives on the stage who represent your people in Hungary. I place them directly in your hands. 
Bless each one in this congregation and audience, too. They come from every corner of this vast trans-European division. And Lord, I just pray that you will keep us unified in you as we look to the mission you have entrusted into our hands. And may this beautiful experience in Hungary only be the beginning of the power that we will see spread across Europe in the proclamation of this precious Advent message. Bless Hungary, bless the Hungarian Union, bless each person in this group, and bless all those in the trans-European division as they unitedly push forward in reaching Europe to connect, inspire, and change all through the power of the Holy Spirit. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. The scripture reading for tonight is taken from Luke chapter 15, that famous parable that Jesus told about the lost and that they are found. I read to you from Luke chapter 15, from verse 8 onwards. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp? Sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the word of the Lord. Should I say something? I got only one message with my song. That Jesus gonna make it everything all right. I would like to sing this song with you. And in refrain, uh, it's so easy. So we start to practicing now four times. And the song goes like this. Jesus. Jesus gonna make it all right Jesus gonna make it all right Jesus gonna make it all right One more time <clears throat> Jesus gonna make it all right Okay I'm carrying my head down in the drugstore But I fail And I miss my flight So I turn all my weapons into my mind She said Jesus gonna make it a right Jesus gonna make it a right I'm carrying my hot body to the doctor. He said, Slauko, you won't leave through the night. I'm carrying my body to my mama. She said, Jesus gonna make it all right. Jesus gonna make it all right.
is gonna make it all right Turn myself as a hunter Lying on a losing the night But I turn all my weapons into my mind You know what she said, she said Jesus gonna make it all right Jesus gonna make it all right Don't hear you <laughs> Okay Thank you Almost exactly 20 years ago, I was working in the communication department at the British Union Conference when an interesting news story landed on my desk. One of our young progressive pastors from the North England Conference had been entered into a competition run by the Times newspaper and with significant prize money at stake. The competition was to find the preacher of the year. To cut a long story short, Pastor Ian Sweeney was shortlisted for the top six, and then in a final stage preach-off, he won. He was the first Seventh-day Adventist and the first black preacher to have won this prestigious competition. And in doing so, he broke down a number of prejudices and preconceptions. Since then, he's become a much sought-after speaker around the world for his wisdom, for his biblical knowledge, and his down-to-earth presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now serving as the president of the British Union Conference, we welcome to our pulpits in a few minutes' time Pastor Ian Sweeney. I have the dream of a church which is a worshipping church. Whose people come together to meet God and worship Him. Who know God is always in their midst and who bow down before Him in great humility to regularly frequent the table of the Lord Jesus. To celebrate his mighty acts of redemption as shown us on the cross. Who enrich the worship with their musical skills. Who believe in prayer and lay hold of God in prayer. Whose worship is expressed not in Sabbath services and prayer gatherings only, but also in homes. Their weekday work and the common things of life. I have a dream of a worshipping church. Never has a sermon meant so much. Ten minutes, one thousand pounds. I did return tithe. <laughs> and I spent the rest. You know, Luke in chapter 15, he told three parables of lostness, of which every one of us is familiar. And in the first parable, Jesus posed the question in verse 4, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them, doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? What is the correct answer? Yes or no? 
a thousand pastors and you ain't sure? <laughs> what is the correct answer? Do you leave 99 to look for one? I heard somebody honestly say no. But Jesus, in asking the question, it seems to me, was saying, look, the answer is obvious, yes. That's what you do, but you leave 99 in search of one missing. And some of us will say, yes, that's what we should do, that's what we would do, but however, our practice and our statistics testify that the answer is actually no. That isn't what we do. So in the second question of the second parable, Christ asked, well, suppose a woman has 10 silver coins, loses one, doesn't she light a lamp and sweep the house and search until she finds it? So let me ask this, what is the answer to that question? Do you do it or don't you? Yes or no? Yes, of course you do. But again, our practice is probably no. You see, I believe that Jesus, in telling these three parables, did not have the intention of simply saying the same thing in each of the parables. And actually, of the three parables, the second, which is possibly the least preached, it is certainly for me the most disturbing. So why do you say that, Ian? Well, I'm glad you asked me. We preach and we paint the picture of a sheep being found and carried on the shoulders of the good shepherd back to the fold. We, we paint that wonderful picture of the sheep hanging around the neck or being carried around the neck. In the third parable, we preach that wonderful picture of, of a father God running back to, uh, running to his son who had been lost in a far country. But this second parable doesn't paint pretty pictures. It's difficult to paint a dramatic picture of a lost and a found coin. It doesn't carry the same force or intensity. There's no cute lamb or son beaten up by sin. Rather, the second parable is just about an inanimate object, a coin. However, it is the most disturbing of the three. Why? Why do you keep asking me? The parable is disturbing because it places a focus on the owner and the state of her house. Here's why the parable is troubling. We are busy trying to find lost coins outside of the house. And I've served as a conference evangelist. And yet there are coins which are lost in the house. That's disturbing. They're not on the mountainside like the sheep. They're not like the younger son who's in a far, far country. They are still in the house, but they are lost. Coins that are still at home, their names are still on ACMS data membership list, complying to European GDPR regulations, but still they're lost. Now maybe we shouldn't be surprised at how easily it is to lose things in the house. Back in the day, in jo when Josiah was the king of Judah, they lost the word of God in the temple. So maybe we shouldn't be so surprised about what we can lose in the house. And you see, this parable is most disturbing for me because of the intimation of blame behind the lost. 
This second parable intimates that there are those who are lost because of us. In other words, it's our fault. Now, I find that disturbing. And it gets even worse. My favorite Christian author, Ellen White, wrote that we don't even care about the lost. In a little book entitled Christ Object Lessons, page 191, paragraph 3, she said, In heaven angels weep while human eyes are dry and hearts are closed to pity about the lost. We don't care. I love my church. I, love, you know, I was born in the church, third row. But we've got issues. And you know that we conducted, the Seventh-day Adventist Church conducted a study where many hundreds of, well, thousands of people, as I understand it, who had left our church were asked, why did you leave? And the findings were both fascinating and frightening. So let me share some of the findings or to remind you of what you read. Let me just build this up. 79% of the people who had left the church and who responded to the interviews, uh, to the questionnaire said, 79% of those who had left said, we still believe in the authority and the teaching of Scripture even though we've left. 79% of those who left said we still believe in the Bible. 58% of those who left the church said they still believed in the authority and the teachings of my favorite Christian author, Ellen White. However, of the four highest reasons why they left the church, all four top reasons were us. We are the primary reason why people leave the church. The number one reason, now don't get upset with me, I, I haven't left the church, I was born in this church, still in it. This is what they said. Number one reason, they said, was us, specifically the hypocrisy they perceived and witnessed in us. They were tired of our hypocrisy in church and in home. Now, I have a confession to make. I'm on a journey, but I love hypocrites. And I suspect some of you love hypocrites too. As a matter of fact, the world loves hypocrites. They celebrate hypocrites in the United States every year at a global ceremony called the Oscars. You ever heard of that? Yeah, you watched it. I know it ain't on 3ABM, but you watched it. And I love hypocrites. And I love certain hypocrites. I love me some Morgan Freeman. He's on Hope Channel. If you watch carefully, you'll see him. <laughs> and I watch Morgan Freeman. I mean, Morgan Freeman played the role of God twice. But watching him act on a screen is different to watching church members act. And folks said, I don't mind watching Morgan Freeman do his hypocrisy, but I really can't stand seeing actors in my church. The number three reason, and I know I've jumped over number two, I'll get back to that, but the number three reason they said why we left the church was us, specifically because they did not have friends in the church. 
Now, in the British Union Conference, there is a custom and tradition where we call one another brother and sister. Hello, brother so-and-so. Hello, sister so-and-so. And and we may in the church see that as normal, but it's kind of weird outside the church. I don't call my next-door neighbor Jed brother. But folks said, we left the church Not because they were calling me brother or sister. We left because they were calling me brother or sister, but I had no friends. The number four reason they said why they left the church, again being us, but was specifically the high level of conflict in their local church. Again, I'm on a journey, but I like to watch two grown men fighting each other, called boxing. I know you don't like it, and God bless you, but I'm I'm on my journey, and we're two adult men who are hitting each other for millions of pounds. I like to watch it. And there's a there is a boxer in the United Kingdom. He's, in the, he's from the town where the union office is held called Anthony Joshua. He's a big brother and he's a strong brother. And he was fighting, I believe it was Klitschko, one of the Klitschko brothers. And this was a big fight. It was coming on on a Saturday night, and it was pay-per-view. That is to say, you had to pay a company a whole lot of money to watch the fight. Now, I love boxing, but I love money more than the boxing. And I was not prepared to pay the 20-something pounds. But I have a son, pray for him. And he turned the channel over from Hope Channel and 3ABN and and paid the money to watch the boxing, and I felt, well, if he's paying for it, I may as well watch it too. (laughs) But folks say they leave our church because of the fights they witness in their congregations, in our church, in our board meetings, in our business meetings, in our sessions against the pastor, against the board, against one another. Watching boxing on the television is one thing, but people don't pay per view to watch us fight in church. Don't get upset with me. I didn't say that's why I left. I'm still in the church. The number two reason that I jumped over, and I'm not going to dwell on this, they said the reason they left the church is divorce. People have left the house. Not so much they didn't believe what we believe, but because of us. Still believe in the Bible, still believe in the authority and the teachings of Ellen White. They believe that stuff, but they have seen our hypocrisy, our lack of friendliness, how we love to fight in our churches as well as in our homes. And they have voted with their feet and they have said, the Lord watch between me and thee while we are absent one from another. That's troubling. This second parable, the least preached, but for me the most disturbing. Again, working with that intimation of blame. If I were to ask you, who was primarily to blame for the sheep being lost? Who's to blame? How did that one out of the hundred end up on the mountainside? Some folk who have never kept sheep would argue quite confidently it's the shepherd's fault. Others would say, well, surely it's the sheep. Easier question, who was primarily to blame for the lostness of the younger son? Well, it was the younger son, surely. 
certainly not, not, nothing to do with the father, definitely the younger son. But who was primarily to blame for the lostness of the coin? Did the coin decide to lose itself? Coin just decided, you know what, I'm fed up hanging around with these other nine folk. No. Coins do not lose themselves. Careless owners lose their property. And Jesus intimates that there are those who are lost to him from his house because of the carelessness of those in whose hands they are entrusted. This is disturbing. Gave my favorite Christian author, Ellen White, in one telling sentence, declares in that book, Christ Object Lessons, this time page 170, she wrote this sentence, in the household, there is often great carelessness concerning the souls of its members. Now, I know that the thought, and I was troubled by this, the thought of our carelessness, being responsible for people being lost, immediately raises objections in our minds. We say to us, well, people are lost because they choose to be lost. We say, well, it's the sifting. It's the shaking. It's the purifying of the church. We say, well, a person being lost, it's ultimately their own decision, their own choice, their own volition. Maybe so. But I believe that Jesus, through the parable of the lost coin, is calling upon every one of us as leaders, as fellow church members, to consider our individual responsibility to the loss of those coins within our house. And I don't know if it happens elsewhere, but certainly in the British Union, our language betrays our carelessness to one another. So here's an example. A member is missing for six weeks from church. We show our carelessness when we say, hello, stranger. Not once in six weeks did we pick up the Apple phone and reach out to that lost coin. But we have the audacity to say on the Sabbath, after six weeks of absence, hello, stranger. And then linked to that rudeness, we then unite it with lies, and oh, how we love to tell lies on Sabbath by saying to them, I missed you. Six weeks, you haven't seen me. Now, I've only been in Serbia since yesterday. I had best re reach out to my wife within six hours. But we will say, oh, I missed you. But not once in six weeks did we dare reach out to them. We call them stranger, and we lie to say we miss them. You see, Jesus in this parable is calling upon every one of us to consider our responsibility to the discovery of those lost coins in the house. Now, I do not believe that this parable is simply about apportioning blame. But as uncomfortable as it may be, there are cases where we have been in some measure responsible for losing coins within the house through our carelessness. Now, New Testament scholarship suggests that these 10 coins were drachmas minted out of silver, each coin being worth a typical week's wage. 
And the mention of her possessing 10 coins implies that these 10 coins were all that she had. Sometimes we look at each other as coins and we don't appreciate the value of one another. I've served at churches where they seem to have the spiritual gift of running out the young people out of church. And I had to say, senior members, we cannot afford to be dismissive of the recently minted coins. They are all that we have. Take care of them. And similarly to younger minted coins, who are dismissive of the ancient minted coins, take care of them. They are all that we have. But sometimes we deal with one another as though we can easily replace that which is lost. Surely it's far easier to treasure what we have in the house. But maybe it's the case that there is a greater sorrow expressed in our lives when we lose money than when we lose people. There is a greater anxiety when tithe goes down and offering goes down than when 15 people are no longer attending our congregations. So long as the money's still there, we're okay. But let us never forget that as a lamb is precious to its shepherd, or as a son is precious to his father, so is a silver coin precious to its owner, for they are all that we have. Every coin in the house is precious. It's all that we've got. And understand that the silver coin, in being lost, was still valuable. And so the lady, realizing her carelessness, decided to rectify the situation. And this is why this parable is, dis is disturbing. The Bible reads, does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, search carefully until she finds it? That's disturbing. You see, the lady's home of the time when Jesus spoke, as was common for the time, only had a dirt floor. A silver coin dropped onto the floor would quickly be covered and camouflaged by dust and dirt. Now, I stayed in, at an airport hotel one time that was so dirty, broken down, and in need of being demolished that during the night when I attempted to sleep, I was awoken by strange scuttling sounds. I decided not to turn on the light. I was fearful of what I would see. So I just heard the scuttling and just said, Lord, it's soon be morning and I'm on a plane out of here. We think that turning on a light is good. It isn't always good. We think that sweeping the house is always good. She did not have a vacuum cleaner. She had to sweep the dust. There were small windows. It was difficult for her to spot the coin. And probably as the brush went along the floor, she was listening for the clink of the coin. And as she swept the floor, you can imagine that the dust was being disturbed. It would have been unpleasant for her for, as the dust was going into her eyes, into her, notes, in, into her nose and into her throat. Cleaning the house isn't pleasant business. That's why some of us get maids. But yet as unpleasant as an experience as it was, it was worth it because the silver coin was priceless. And permit me to suggest from this parable that we have to examine 
and even expose ourselves in the light of Christ's word. And as unpleasant as an experience as it is, we have to recognize that sometimes we have failed our Lord Jesus in the loss of some of our precious coins. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, some of the decisions we mandated on board meetings and at business meetings contributed to the loss of coins. We didn't think about it at the time, but they have made the decisions that had a deep effect on some of those coins. It's unpleasant to look back at my own ministry and some of the stupidity that I did. But the dust has to be disturbed. The light, the lamp needs to be turned on. And when we think about the lostness of the house, some of it, it's very real to us as pastors. The loss is in the house. Some of us have won so many people to the Lord Jesus Christ, but in our own house, our kids, our children have gone. In some traditions, in some cultures, there were attempts to beat the love of Jesus into our children. Doesn't work. For some of us, Maybe we were too lenient and spoiling of our children. But this parable calls upon us just to do some self-reflection in the light of God's word and sweep some of that dust, as unpleasant as it may be. But don't despair. The woman whose coin was lost searched through all the unpleasantness, but she found it at last. And Ellen White wrote this to us as parents. This is found again in the book Christ Object Lessons, page 195, paragraph 3. She wrote, but those who have been guilty of neglect are not to despair. The woman whose coin was lost searched until she found it. So in love, faith, and prayer, let parents work for their households until with joy they can come to God saying, Behold, I am the children whom the Lord hath given me. Isaiah 8 verse 18. There is nothing more painful than the loss in the house. And even when we do everything perfectly and correctly, there are no guarantees the Father God lost one-third of his angelic children. And again, in some traditions and cultures, we boast about how all of our children are still in the church. And clearly, you must have done something wrong. That's why you've lost your children. Well, I'm with God in the sense that he is the perfect father and he lost a third. It's painful. Ellen White's twin sister, Elizabeth, to our knowledge, her twin sister never believed or accepted what her sister taught and lived for. There are people close to us and they just don't follow or get still lost in the house. But this parable is a call to every one of us to have the heart of Jesus Christ. You see, he valued us so much that he moved out of the mansions of glory to come and live upon this earth. You see, Jesus is the good shepherd who left heaven to find the lost sheep, the lost coin, and a lost son. You see, Jesus is a shepherd who puts great value on the lost. 
Indeed, Jesus is prepared to leave the 99 who are in the fold to seek one who is lost. Jesus values our lost coins, sons, and daughters in the house. He values our lost spouses. He values our lost young people. And all he is asking for us to do as pastoral leaders in the trans-European division is saying, please allow me to use you to be an opportunity to rescue and find the lost. God is always in the business of searching for the lost. Wherever the lost are, whoever the lost are, Christ wants to find them. Whether they be lost sons and daughters, lost members, lost spouses, lost siblings, lost parents, lost friends, Christ still wants to find the lost. And this European Pastoral Council is an opportunity for every one of us, myself most definitely included, to allow Christ to make me an instrument for the discovery and the welcoming of the lost. You see, Jesus valued the lost so much that he not only became the good shepherd to search for the lost lamb, but he became a lamb who died for my sins. Let's look and love and find the lost. May our final song be the prayer of all our hearts so that we can be filled so, so much of the Holy Spirit that we know how best to reach the lost in our congregations and in our circles. Please stand as we sing.
Our heads are bowed. Heavenly Father, the fact that we are here is because of your love and desire to find the lost. Please, Lord, make us an instrument to find lost coins in our house. Use us to be the men, women, leaders you would have us be as instruments of grace that we might draw others nearer to you. Thank you for troubling our complacency in that little parable. May we be better for the experience in Jesus Christ. Amen.